First John chapter 5. We are, God willing, going to finish up the book today, unless the rapture comes first. And uh, do you all know what Maranatha means? It means, come quickly, Lord. Come, O oh Lord. It's, a, it's a, an expression that the early church used. So Maranatha, may he come soon. We're going to look at the very end of 1 John 2. Let me tell you a story. A week ago Monday, so two weeks ago tomorrow, I was out of town and I got a phone call about a very difficult and challenging but very worth doing job that needed doing. But I'm out of town. I even had limited cell phone signal. So I tried to get hold of my friend Chuck, and I failed to get hold of him. And I dumped the job in his lap anyway. And he came through. You can ask me the details or ask him the details later if you're curious. Do you have a friend that you can count on to do you a favor when you need it? Do you have someone you can count on who's happy to do favors for you? I hope you do in this life. And part of the message of this last paragraph in 1 John is that Jesus is that person and he's happy to do favors for you and me. And it expresses it both generally, broadly, and expresses it with a specific kind of favor that Jesus is happy to do for us. Read with me 1 John chapter 5. We're going to be discussing starting with verse 14 today. But let's go ahead and pick it up at verse 13. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. This is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request which we have heard, asked from him. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask, and God will for him give life to those who commit sin not leading to death. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say that he should make requests for this. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not leading to death. We know that no one who is born of God sins, but he who was born of God keeps him, and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are of God and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Verse 21, little children, guard yourselves from idols. Marty, I'm booming a little bit. Let's pray. Our Father God, I thank you that Jesus came and died for us so that through knowing him we can know that we have eternal life. And thank you also that we can have confidence that he is there for us. There for us in every way, particularly in answered prayer. Thank you, Lord, that he promises to Rescue those for whom we pray. And Lord, thank you that we can know him personally and have confidence and assurance and faith in knowing him. Lord, use us to share the truth of the good news with people around us. Lord, we pray for our nation. We pray for the world. We see things going from bad to worse. We acknowledge that 
Satan is still the ruler of this world and that Jesus has not yet come back to destroy him. And Lord, we look forward to that day. Thank you for the promise that we are protected until that day. Help us to walk with you. Speak to us now through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. In the book of 1 John, John has woven together a lot of different things. And by the way, next week, I believe I'm planning to go ahead and preach on 2 John, and we'll do 3 John and Jude. We're right there. We'll go continue with them. In 2 John and 3 John, John writes them as letters with an opening heading and with a closing, uh, I'm looking forward to being with you to talk face-to-face kind of ending, both of them. Here in 1 John, he doesn't end that way. He ends with a summary of some of the key themes he's been talking about all through the book. At the very end, he talks about Jesus' identity. Right before that, he talks about knowing we're in Christ and being safe. But at the beginning of this passage, he talks about answered prayer and about prayer for other people. The two themes that he's bringing out again in this last application are faith in God, confidence in God, relationship with God, and the other big theme all through the book, love. Praying for your brother or sister in Christ who is sinning is an expression of love. So let's see how John brings those two themes through here. In verses 14 and 15, he talks about the fact that we can have confidence before him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And we'll talk about the exception in a moment. But we can be confident that he hears our prayers. My friends, it is a blessing that we can pray to God the Father in Jesus' name through the intercession of the Holy Spirit and know for sure that our prayers are getting through. My wife this next week will be attending the Catholic funeral of a family member. In Roman Catholicism, they have what are called litanies of over and over and over again crying out to this saint or that and and hoping that you'll get through to the saint who is supposed to be an intermediary to God. We can pray directly to Jesus and have confidence that he's there to answer our prayers. He delights to answer our prayers. In reminding them of this, um, John is reminding them, is reviewing in a sense, twice Jesus promised answered prayer in the Last Supper discourse. That's in John chapter 14 and John chapter 16. The Father himself is happy to hear from us, Jesus says. We can go to God directly in prayer. That's an awesome privilege. Are we taking advantage of that privilege? How much time do we spend in prayer? How much is prayer a focus of ours? What does it take to break us out of our routine and get us praying more? I know the answer to that question. You know what it takes to get us praying more? Troubles, hardships, Pain, all of a sudden there's something you really, really want. You, yeah. Don't wait for that. Be a person of prayer. And then there's that exception clause, if we pray according to his will. Well, how does that work? I'm not a Facebook person, um, Uh, My Facebook page is just a parking spot for the church's Facebook page, and Jody handles the church's Facebook page. I don't. Uh, I think the last time I posted something on Facebook was a bike ride a year ago, and I don't go on there very often. And if you want to try to get hold of me, text me, call me, email me. Don't send me a Facebook message. I'll see it six weeks from now. Don't, Don't even bother. But this past Thursday, I went on Facebook. Why do you suppose I'm on Facebook? This past Thursday, I was trying to find out if Harry and Nancy came through the hurricane okay. And I know that Harry and Nancy are both Facebookers, and Harry and Nancy came through the hurricane just fine. 
and they posted stuff about it on Facebook. You want to know? Go look. So I'm scrolling down Harry's timeline, and Harry's got all these humorous memes up about this, that, or the other, and he's got a clip from a Christian comedian talking about prayer requests. Hey, bro, I need you to pray for me. I've, 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 I've really got this, this thing going. I need you to pray for me. Okay, I can pray for you. Uh, well, well, what you need? Well, I've got a drug test tomorrow and I need to pass. <laughs> uh, no, sorry, I can't pray for that. And of course, the, the comedian that Harry has up on his Facebook page it says it, tells, the, tells the joke a whole lot more humorously than I can. But... Um, what kinds of things do we pray for? What kinds of things should we pray for? Well, I quote some comedian that Harry Angst is into. Um, let, let's, let's take a little bit more serious note. I was reading one of the old school commentaries on this passage. We're talking the 18th, 19th century, the overlap there. A guy by the name of A.R. Fawcett, if you care. And he says, well, we pray God's will, and of course, what we ultimately want is God's will, so what we want is God's will, and that's what we're praying for. Well, yes, ideally, theoretically, in the abstract. But do you or I ever really, really want things and really, really pray them and we're, we're not sure they're God's will or it doesn't seem like they're God's will after the fact? Even Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, the whole human side of his nature was utterly rejecting the notion of being tortured to death, as you and I would. And he's praying... Yet not my will, but thine be done. Praying according to God's will. Part of the practice of prayer, part of the purpose of prayer, part of the exercise of prayer is bringing our will into alignment with God's will. And how do we know what God's will is? How do we know how to pray according to God's will? Well, this book is full of pointers about that. Let me share with you just two of them. First of all, from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. This is the will of God, your sanctification. That is, that you abstain from sexual immorality. Sanctification means becoming holy. Sanctification means holiness. God's will is for you and me to be holy. And he makes it practical, specifically the kind of holiness he's talking about in this context is sexual immorality. God's will is for you and I to become holy. Jesus' work in our lives now, Jesus' ministry to us, the aspect of our salvation that's now is sanctification, is making us more holy. When you pray, God, change me. God, help me overcome this sin. God, make me more holy. God, draw me closer to you. That is a prayer that we know is in accordance with God's will. And he delights in it. Pray according to God's will. Don't hesitate to pray according to God's will. This one I mentioned earlier in the prayer time, the prayer focus, the first four verses of uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2. First of all, then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men. See that there? And by the way, the Greek word there is uh, anthropos, which means humankind. It's not limited to the male half of humanity, by the way. Made on behalf of all men. For kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. Often I pray for our leaders, pray for revival in my pulpit prayer. But we're supposed to pray on behalf of all men. What? This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. 
When you and I pray for our unsaved loved ones or neighbors or co-workers or random strangers to get saved, you're praying according to the will of God. God desires people to get saved. Don't hesitate to pray according to God's will. We'll talk more about that a little bit going ahead, but let's move on. These verses talked about him hearing. It also says that he answers. Verse 15, if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests which we have asked from him. Our relationship with Jesus gives us confidence that he wants to answer our prayers and that he will answer our prayers. Do you have fellowship, close, intimate relationship with Jesus? Where you count on him to answer your prayers and you also count on him that if it doesn't happen the way you wanted it, it's because he's got a better plan in mind. Relationship with him can give us confidence in prayer. That's the general, the broad promise of answered prayer. See it there in verses 14 and 15. Broad promise of answered prayer in general. And then he narrows it down to a specific one. The broad promise of answered prayer is about faith, trusting God. The specific promise of answered prayer is about loving our brothers and sisters in Christ. What we've been instructed to do repeatedly all through this book. Read with me again, beginning with verse 16. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask, and God will for him give life to those who commit sin, not leading to death. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say that he should make requests for this. Verse 17, all unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not leading to death. That's a promise. It's not set out as a command, but obviously, the takeaway from it is to do it. When you or I see a sinning brother, pray for them. I use the term backslidden there. I used to think backslidden was just a Baptist term, but it's in, actually it's in the Bible. It's in Jeremiah. But um, the, the wording in the text doesn't necessarily limit to somebody who's in a pattern of sin. The wording can mean just an individual sin. You see a fellow Christian sinning, pray for them. What do we tend to do when we see a fellow Christian sin? What was that? Judge. We judge them. Okay, that was on my list. It wasn't the first one I was going to get to, but most definitely we get all judgmental and holier than thou. And can you believe what that dirty, rotten character did? James warns us not to judge because we have no authority to condemn. Why are we judging? We have no authority to, to, to condemn. Pray for them. Something else we tend to do when we see a brother or sister in sin is ignore it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul chewed out the church at Corinth in the strongest terms because there was immorality in their midst and they were ignoring it. It's one, of the, it's one of the harshest passages in the New Testament and it strained relationships between Paul and the church at Corinth. Don't ignore sin. You know what else that can be a danger to us when we see a brother or sister in Christ sinning? We can be drawn into sin. 
Sin begets sin. We can draw into the, be drawn into their sin or we can counter it with a sin of our own. Either way, sin begets sin. In Jude, we're warned to rescue those who are perishing, but some people that you rescue, you have to rescue real carefully, being careful not to, not to be contaminated. Don't be contaminated by sin. When you see a brother or sister sinning, pray for them. Pray for them. By the way, the verse before has the broad, the broad promise of God answering prayer. And then it gets specific about praying for a brother or sister who's in sin. I encourage you in your prayer need, in your, your hurting time of prayer, particularly if you are struggling with worry and you come to God in prayer, which is the right thing to do, Come to God with thanksgiving. We're taught that in Philippians 4, 6. After you have brought your problem to God and laid it at his feet, pray for somebody else. Change gears and pray for somebody else. You see, praying about the problem God, I've got this problem, and this problem is doing this to me, and I'm afraid this problem is going to turn out this way. I'm, I've got this problem, and, and we've got the problem over here, and God, you need to fix this problem. God, I really, really need help with this problem. Are you all about God? You're zeroing in and focusing on the problem. Turn it over to God, and then change gears and intercede for somebody else. Go pray for somebody else. Get off the, the, the lotus position, navel-gazing, and pray for somebody else. It can be a... It can be a freeing thing that helps get you out of that loop. Pray for somebody else. Pray compassion on somebody else. And then the exception clause here. No, before the exception clause, one more thing I want you to see. Looking at it, verse 16. I'm reading it aloud. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask, and God will for him give life who commits sin not leading to death. That's what the verse says. God will rescue him for you. There's a little bit of a problem. A lot of your translations, a lot of our English translations leave out those two little words. Here is how it reads in the New American Standard, which is what I have open in front of you, for him. I looked it up. It's definitely there. There's not a textual variant. It's not like verse 7 up above where we're not sure it's there or not. It's just the translators. It's... it's hard to fit into English grammar. It's literally to him. It's just the Greek preposition with, the, with the, uh, the, the, the grammatical apparatus that goes with it that makes it to him. But that tells us a key thing about God and about how God relates to us. You see a brother or sister in Christ sinning and you pray for them God wants to rescue them because God is loving and caring and rescuing. He's the the father in the picture, the story of the prodigal son. He, He cares and wants to draw them back to himself. Yes, that's who he is about them. But you pray for your brother or sister in Christ. God wants to rescue them as a favor to you. God will for you rescue that prodigal that so desperately needs rescuing from the pig pen. God will for you restore the sinning brother. God wants to do it as a favor for you. It's in his will. It's in his identity. He's the savior. Jesus was the one that gave us the story of the hundred lost, or the one lost sheep out of a hundred and went chasing after that lost sheep. That's how God operates. But also God wants to do it as a favor for you. And then there's that exception clause. Except uh, the guys that have committed the sin not leading to death. Well, all unrighteousness is sin. It says so right there in the verse, and we're also taught that in James. But there, there's, the, there's this other category of sin leading unto death. talk about that a couple of different ways. I've noticed in myself, and I've noticed in other people, we have 
almost contradictory and not necessarily logical reactions to the exception clauses in the prayer verses. Some of the promises of answered prayer in the New Testament are just the abbreviated version and leaves out the exception clause. And we read that verse, or here, I don't need to point at you, I'll point at me. I read that verse, and my first thought is, well, what about such and such that I prayed for that didn't happen? That that, that verse says it's going to happen. Why, 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 why? You know? Or, earlier, we've got the exception clause. Well, if you're praying according to my will, well, that, 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 that kind of hollows out the whole promise. We, we look at the exception clause and we complain about it. And here, pray for a sinning brother unless he's committed a sin unto death. And, and we zero in on that and say, what in the world is a sin leading unto death? Well, let's examine that. What in the world is a sin leading unto death? What is John talking about? Let me give you a a, a solid, straightforward answer. I don't know. Let me give you some suggestions. A sin leading unto death could be a sin where God instantly zaps the person. Remember Ananias and Sapphira? God zapped him. Well, you don't have to worry about that one. If they're zapped, it's too late to pray for him anyway. A sin leading unto death could be a sin for which the church excommunicates you. I've already mentioned 1 Corinthians 5. Excommunication there is described as being delivered over to Satan for the destruction of the body in hopes that they'll, that they'll be saved. That could, could refer to that. In 1 Corinthians 11, we're warned against partaking of the communion service in an unworthy manner. And it says, you can die from doing that. Those are three scriptural possibilities for what John's referring to here. I don't think it's referring to heresy about Jesus or lostness or, or, or the unpardonable sin or one of those things because he's talking about a fellow believer. He says if you see a brother committing sin, he's talking about a believer. He's not talking about a lost person. But um, he, he does put in the exception that if, if somebody's doing this, then, then, then praying for him might necessarily have the outcome that you're hoping for. And yet, don't be hung up on the exception clause. Look at the promise. In any case, he doesn't forbid us from praying even for the person that may have committed that hypothetical sin, right? And if so-and-so has committed that sin, how likely are we to know it? God has saved some pretty lost people in the past, including Saul of Tarsus that became the Apostle Paul. Don't worry about the exception clause. Don't worry about the unanswerable question. Pray. Leave it in God's hands. Let me bring up another unanswerable question. If a dog commits a sin and I pray for him and God rescues him, well, if I pray for him, that's great. But Doug also is responsible for dealing with his own sin. He's got to get right with God too. His personal responsibility, his free will, if you want to use that term, come into it. How does that work together with my praying for him and God promises to answer? I don't know. Is that my problem? That's God's problem. Is it a problem to God? It's on his side of the game board. Don't worry about the aspects of it we can't understand. Do you understand prayer? If God knows what's going to happen tomorrow, how does my praying something today change things? 
If we wait until we understand prayer before we do it, we'll never do it. We do things all the time that we don't understand. Do you understand how your phone works? Do you use it? There's just one quick example. Don't worry about the unanswerable questions. Leave those things in God's hands and pray. Pray generally. Pray God's will. Pray specifically. Pray for your brother or sister who sins. Or for your brother or sister who is sinning and away from God. Pray. The takeaway is to pray. When you or I see a brother or sister in Christ in sin. In Galatians chapter 6 it says we are to restore them. Do we extend to them a helping hand? Or do we extend to them an accusing finger? The command in the book is to love. Praying for them is one of the ultimate expressions of that love. We can pray for other people's sins. How does that work? God knows. We can pray about other people's sins. On the reverse side of your sermon notes, there are a bunch of scriptures there, and it's a little bit different than a lot of the ones I give you. A lot of times I just give you the verses. Here I've given you the references and the principle taken away from each one of those references. You can pray about each other's sins. Particularly parents, you have spiritual authority over your children. Be the priests of your family like Job was the priest of his. Pray for your children. Plead the blood of Christ over a brother or sister in Christ who sins. Restore those who are weak. I encourage that, that study on the reverse side of your sermon notes to, uh, to your careful attention. But right now, let's go on through the rest of First John. Read with me again verses 18 and 19. We know that no one who is born of God sins, but he who is born of God keeps him, and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are of God and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. We are in him who is true in his Son, Jesus Christ. If you belong to God, you are protected. If you belong to God, God is the one who keeps you from sin. If you belong to God, God is the one that ultimately will make sure that you're still saved when it's time to meet God. Let me share with you just one verse about that. I'm going to close the service with this verse later as our benediction. This is the closing benediction in the little New Testament book of Jude. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. See that? And to make you stand in the presence of his glory blameless with great joy. To the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord. Be glory, majesty, dominion and authority. Before all time and now and forever. Amen. God is the one who will keep us from sinning, keep us from stumbling. Pray to him to do that. Remember in, in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus' model of sort of a daily prayer, lead us not into temptation. Do you pray for God to keep you from temptation and to keep you from falling into it? God can keep us from sin. God wants to keep us from sin. God also keeps us from the evil one. Back in chapter 3, verse 4, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And now look again at verse 19. We know that we are of God and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Well, wait a minute. God is in control, right? Yes, God is in control. 
but the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Satan is still the ruler of this world. Jesus referred to him as the ruler of this world in John 12 and 14. Satan is the ruler of this world. Satan is the God of this age. The Apostle Paul referred to him as the God of this age in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. Satan is the prince of the power of the air. Paul referred to the devil that way in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. And Hebrews chapter 2, verse 8 tells us that we do not yet see everything under Jesus' feet. Is that reality in our lives? Is that intuitive to you? Is it, does everything look like a theocracy with Jesus running the show? No, we're not in the millennium yet. We're not in heaven yet. Jesus is coming back to defeat the devil. That's what the book of Revelation pictures. But we belong to God now. And we are part of his kingdom now. And we can stand for him now. And the promise is we belong to God and God protects us now. When you see things going from bad to worse, when things don't turn out the way you want them, when it seems like the bad guys are winning, realize that, yes, Satan is still running the show. But God is ultimately in charge, and God is working out his plan, and Jesus is coming soon. That's the promise of protection here at the end of this book. And then look again at the last two verses. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. How can we know God? Through his Son who came to die for us. How can we know God? Through his Holy Spirit that points us to Jesus and enables us to understand spiritual things. How can we know God? Through an intimate relationship with his Son, Jesus Christ. An interesting thing about little children that you observe even in children from troubled families or children with, with, with mean parents is that they know who mommy and daddy are and they cling to mommy and daddy even if mommy and daddy are less than optimum. Do you have that kind of a relationship with the kind and loving and caring and perfect God through his son? We know God through Jesus Christ. He sent his son. And I've emphasized this all through the book. All through the book. We've jumped ahead to this verse I don't know how many times. But look at the very end of verse 20. Jesus is the true God and eternal life. That matters. That's essential that's fundamental. If you don't get that subset of theology right, that's a fatal error. Jesus is God. It's through him that you have eternal life. Fortunately, it's not in doubt. It's spelled out all through the Bible, particularly the New Testament. This is just one of the clearest places that it states, Jesus is God. Do we understand the Trinity? Again, no. Do we believe what the Bible teaches? Yes. So what's the overall takeaway of the passage? Live in faith, live in hope, live in love. Trust God for answered prayer. Trust God to rescue those that we pray for, whether they're lost or whether they need to come back to the Father. Walk in relationship with Jesus. 
And then right at the end of the book, again, he doesn't close it with a hope to see you soon and, uh, and I'm praying for you. How does he close the book? What's the final punch in verse 21? Little children, guard yourselves from idols. In the society in which John was writing to the believers, idolatry was rampant, literal open idolatry. There's plenty of that still in the world today. In chapter 2, John warned us against the idolatry of loving the world and the things in the world. That's idolatry. Paul warns us that greed is idolatry. And boy, our society, our culture, our media push us into that kind of idolatry. The idolatry that's right here we're warned against at the very end of the book is a false picture of who Jesus is. You believe in Jesus? That's great. Are you believing in the real Jesus as pictured in the Bible? There's lots of fake pictures of Jesus out there, and I'm not talking about artist portraits. Jesus is the true God and eternal life. Beware of idolatry. Let's pray. Our Father God, we thank you for this deep and challenging and fascinating little book of 1 John and the joy it's been to work through it. Lord, I pray that you would work in our, in our hearts and deepen our faith in you that we would have confidence before you. That we can have confidence that if we meet you, this next 20 minutes will be in your presence and know you. That we can have confidence that you're happy to answer our prayers and you want what's best for us. You want us to ask. Lord, thank you for not just sending an angel, but sending your son and that he is the true God and that through him we can have eternal life. Lord, work in our hearts. Make us prayer warriors. Prompt us to pray for the lost because you desire them to be saved. And remind us to pray for each other in times of need, in times of sin. And guard us from idolatry. Father God, we worship you. We thank you for your son. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that enables us to understand your salvation. Be glorified in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Worship team and prayer team, you may come forward, please. And if you have a prayer need, come forward and be prayed for. I shared this verse with you as part of the uh, sermon. Today's benediction is the closing blessing. It's a blessing toward God. It's what we call a doxology at the end of the little New Testament book of Jude. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling... And to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy. To the only God, our Father, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. Go with God.